Kemco and Infogrames rescued the Embassy mission for the NES, first released on European PCs in 88, and ported to said system not long after. For those not aware, Rescue the Embassy Mission is based on an original European concept, conceived by two short-lived companies, bit managers, formerly at the time New Frontier, and French game publisher Infogrames, may both companies rest in peace, otherwise alternatively titled as Hostages the Rescue Mission, which revolved around the efforts of a six-unit SWAT team working for the GIGN, or the National Gendarmerie Intervention Group, as they infiltrate a Paris Embassy overrun by a terrorist faction and rescue the captured hostages, hence that alternative titles. Now onto the basic gameplay and controls. Upon starting, you're treated to picking out one of three difficulty modes in the form of ranks no less. Lieutenant, Captain, or Commander. In your desired scenario, Training, Target, Ultimatum, Trigger, or Jupiter, whose differences stem from their required durations, 20, 16, 14, 12, and 10 minutes respectively, not to mention their respective terrorist enemy counts and levels of intensity. Also take note upon starting that the entire game split at three parts. You then take control of the first three GIGN members, Mike, Steve, and Jumbo, as you guide them to their assigned sniping positions parallel to the Embassy while avoiding the spotlights of death. Get exposed to any of them, and your current operative is eliminated. In other words, nailed, pwned, curtains, wiped the fuck out, you get the drift. <coughs> Bottom line, I suggest guiding at least one or two of the operatives towards their respective assigned sniping positions. In terms of their basic defense and stealth abilities, they can crawl or roll throughout the street, and even take cover within various openings, including doorways and even behind fences and windows. During this current phase, you can actually refer back to your map while your operative hides. Should all three sniper operatives get eliminated at any point whatsoever, it's an instant game over. The second part of their Embassy Infiltration tasks then revolves around positioning the next three GIGN members atop the roof, namely Ron, Dick, and Kemco. Get it, like the company that reprogrammed and published this shit? Fire repelling from said roof and into any of the three windows are in various cases 27, none on each applicable side, depending on their desired position. This also involves the previous three, if any of them are still alive, that is, the earlier mentioned Mike, Steve, and Jumbo, taking out any wandering terrorist in silhouette form in the style of the Golgo 13 games by Victor Kai, which you can swap back tactics at any point, or better yet, making any window easier for Rondick and Kemko to break through. Now, going back to the roof-to-window descent phase, you have to gently lower either one of the three into its desired breakpoint to maintain a substantial fringe. In other words, you have to moderately guide your repeller down and then up, pacing his ass and establishing his footing respectively, repeatedly in between, on and on. And should you controlling either one of the three fuck up the center timing, or if a silhouetted terrorist pops up within the window upon an attempted break-in, the cord then snaps off, resulting in the sudden death of your current repeller. And as one could have expected, should the other two repellers meet the same fate during this phase alone, it's an instant fucking game over, no ifs, ands, buts, or maybes there. And finally, this is where the shit really goes down. Upon break-in, a first-person mode, once again in the style of Golgo 13, ensues where you're wiping out every cognacker terrorist, represented by the green dots on the map, constantly shifting positions while rescuing all the hostages, represented by the stationary blue dots, also on the map. The only way to aim your weapon is via the D-pad whilst firing, like in the previous sniping phase, which I forgot to mention, except in front of the hostages. And whatever you do, you can't pussy out, resulting in a suspecting a-hole terrorist wasting the ever-loving shit out of you. Should said accident occur, you have to start back outside with a different operative. And once more, if either of them meet the same goddamn fate, yep, you guessed it. Upon completion of the mission, your outcome is played out in the form of a cutscene, with the obvious as hell exception of the training scenario, depending on its progress, your recent mission, that is, in terms of how many rescuers survived or got eliminated, and even how many victims were saved or accidentally injured. Despite the shockingly short length of the game, on one side of me, nothing personal, I agree wholeheartedly with everyone, and I know what the hell everyone's thinking, but in all total seriousness, let's just keep it all in our goddamn pockets for once! That aside, the controls, though counterintuitive and half-cocked at times, depending on the scene, well, mostly in the case of the first phase, are somewhat compliant, and the gameplay routine, notwithstanding its chaotic and perplexing gripes, is rather decent and can take forever in a fortnight, if in less time, to grasp. Challenge-wise, refer back to the aforementioned rank-based difficulty and operation choices, since they tie in very closely with this current department. Beyond that, no matter which difficulty level and or objective you experiment with, the chances of clearing the entire mission, yet again, depending on whether or not your officer's still alive, are worth a century to compare to a flawless no-kill attempt, which I've tackled a few times before, if maybe many, in the past.
There's absolutely no continues, regardless of your progress or experiments, especially if you're playing the Jupiter mission in either the Captain and or Commander modes. Bottom fucking line, your ass will be signing way more than just your own goddamn death warrants if you fail to maintain an observant mindset no matter which phase you're undergoing. And also take note, an instant game over also applies if you run out of time. While the graphics are nothing much whatsoever to write home about today, they were, however, astonishing and innovative, especially for an NES game from 89. Yes, the same year as Ninja Gaiden, the first Ninja Turtles game, codenamed Viper, Clash of Demon Head, Air Fortress, Burai Fighter, Bayou Billy, Abadox, Double Dragon 2, Dino Wars, Mega Man 2, Adventures of Lolo, Willow, Top Gun the Second Mission, and the like. From the opening intro with the terror sneaking in following the Kemka Lago, to the arrival of the three repellers descending from their chopper, the elaborate window snipe and mini phase, and even the intense yet semi-bland breaking slash rescue scenes, though they haven't matured well throughout the decades, you can tell right away that Kemco had to at least make every element of the original Infogrom's PC game as refined as possible. Seriously, need I go any goddamn further? In terms of music and sound, composed by Hiroyuki Masuno, based on Alberto Jose Gonzalez's original computer soundtrack, most of the original scores are rather memorable, though they're, yet again, not much to drool over, or in this case, headbang-worthy, if maybe at all. My personal favorites being the title theme, the theme for the first stealth phase, and notice how the tension changes every time your swap team member swaps tactics, in terms of taking cover and popping out in order to reach his assigned sniping position. Phase 2, the Sniping and Descent map, which is basically a reprise of the aforementioned melody, and the third and final phase, the Breaking and Hostage Rescue. And the sound effects, let's not even get ourselves started. No sophomoric understatement intended, but they just flat out scream blah, and definitely leave a great deal to be desired, especially the gunshots and death rattles, though they are somewhat gratifying. Replayability-wise, due to, yet again, the differentiating choices of rank-based difficulty and mission parameters, you'll be casually diving right back into this oddity every once in a while, or until its novelty effect wears off like a bottle of cheap-ass cologne, or better yet, every type of repel item in the Pokémon universe. Therefore, my final verdict on Rescue the Embassy mission, even after one quarter of a century, I still enjoy it immensely despite its mind-blowingly short extent, and in full honesty, I wasn't expecting very much considering this was way, way before the Tom Clancy games, and even Call of Duty and various others, with which I highly suggest not getting me started. Even so, in true Atomic Robokid fashion, I'm in the midst of a two-way tie over whether or not I should recommend it to any individual. Merciful as I am, however, I still suggest giving Rescue a chance or two. Who knows, you might be able to progress in more ways than one could possibly grasp. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off.